Good morning and welcome to all of you who've joined us for today's webinar on the fascinating and complex topic of unraveling the intricacies of signaling pathways in protein phosphorylation. My name is Nada Savage and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's session. We're excited to have with us today Dr. Jared Johnson, a scientist from the renowned Lewis Cantley Laboratory at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Dr. Johnson's work is at the very cutting edge of biochemical research and focuses on the intricacies of protein kinases and the rules that guide their signaling. His groundbreaking research has led to the development of a unique and powerful discovery platform. This platform enables the identification of cellular targets for two major categories of protein kinases, serine threonine and tyrosine kinases, and can help decipher the signaling networks that underline phosphoproteomics data. An alumnus of Cornell University, Dr. Johnson obtained his PhD in biochemistry under the guidance and mentorship of Professor Richard Serion. Today, he continues his experimental work in the laboratory of the distinguished Professor Lewis Cantley at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. In today's webinar, Dr. Johnson will guide us through the intriguing world of cellular signaling pathways. He will shed light on their roles in human diseases and share the latest breakthroughs and developments in the field. We encourage you all to actively participate by asking questions in the chat box below. Please mention your email address along with the questions so that we can get back to you if we run out of time. You can also engage with Dr. Johnson later during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This webinar is hosted by SignalChem Biotech, world leader in kinase manufacturing. I now leave the floor to Dr. Johnson. OK, thanks, Netta, and hello, everyone. So before I start, I want to acknowledge my core team. So the work that I'm going to be presenting uh, originated in the laboratory of our fearless leader, Lewis Cantley. And much of this work is really a joint endeavor between me and a talented graduate student, now medical student, Tomer Yaron. I perform the experiments and he performs the computations. We received great help from our computational technician, Emily Huntsman and valuable guidance from Cantley Lab alumni Ben Turk and Mike Yaffe, and also valuable guidance and technical assistance from Brian Joggin, who's a scientist in Mike's lab. And finally, enthusiasm from Peter Hornbeck at Cell Signaling Technology. So this webinar is gonna delve fairly deeply into the field of cell signaling. Now this field can be thought of as the infinite invisible molecular events that uh, enable cells to communicate with each other. And it also regulate virtually every biological process. And importantly, that are deregulated in most human diseases. So these can occur, for example, when a cell receives some type of external cue that causes it to change something about itself. And sometimes quite dramatically, as seen, for example, when a cell is induced by growth factors to undergo proliferation, or when a cell encounters uh, chemotactic cues that cause it to change its morphology and uh, migrate to another location. In more than half a century of scientific research uh, has mapped out many of the molecular events that occur downstream of many different signaling pathways and processes. And these are carried out mostly by proteins. So represented here in this diagram, where we're looking at, at a cell that has encountered, the inside of a cell that is encountered uh, after it's encountered insulin. Now these circles represent proteins. And at the very top, we're going outside of the cell to its external surface. And we're looking at insulin, which is this gray sphere binding to its receptor. This binding event sets off a number of internal signaling cascades that in this case, prepare the cell for incoming nutrients. And so what most of this would look like is our circles with uh, lines and arrows connecting one to the other. And these arrows are meant to represent actions taken by one protein on another in propagating this message. A feature of most signaling pathways is that they have the ability to shut themselves off after they're no longer receiving stimuli sometimes more rapidly than they were turned on. What that means is that most of these events are reversible and nearly and virtually all of them are uh, temporary or transient. That means that in order to experimentally capture these events, you sometimes need to be quick. 
And so that can make uh, research in this field challenging because we're trying to uh, capture something that's temporary. But nevertheless, great progress has been made in our understanding of, of many of the, of the key proteins involved in signaling processes and how they are deregulated in diseases. Now, uh, of course, for anyone entering this field, this means that they're going to quickly encounter large detail-rich diagrams like this that admittedly at first require a lot of rote memorization. A major goal in our research is to build a conceptual framework that allows us to understand how these networks are organized. So what are the rules that are making one arrow go from one protein to another? And more importantly, to understand how these, are, th these events are deregulated in human diseases. Now, just by looking at this diagram, uh, some themes can emerge. For example, the color of each circle representing each protein also represents what the protein does. So up here in gray, we're looking at scaffolding proteins. So these proteins are able to physically engage multiple different proteins and bring them together uh, where they otherwise would probably not meet each other. The purple circles represent G proteins, which can be thought of as molecular timers. The blue circles represent transcription factors. So they have the ability to enter the nucleus and uh, stimulate gene expression and produce more proteins and add more circles to this diagram. And finally, you'll notice uh, a large number of red circles throughout this diagram. Uh, these represent kinases. In fact, mostly protein kinases. So these, so these, these circles, these have the ability to phosphorylate and chemically mark other proteins. So the arrows you see emanating, in this case from AKT, means that it is transferring a phosphate. It is phosphorylating a specific spot on the protein PRAS40. Now the largest group of protein kinases can phosphorylate two of the, out of the 20 amino acids. So using ATP as the phosphodonor, they transfer the gamma phosphate from ATP to the hydroxyl group of serine and threonine. So this ends up introducing a bulky negatively charged moiety to the outer surface of the protein. And this can have a number of downstream consequences to the protein that it was phosphorylated. Uh, equally important is this process is reversible by a second class of enzymes called protein phosphatases. So together, kinases and phosphatases have the ability to chemically mark and remove the mark uh, serines and threonines throughout the proteome. So a major question in uh, my research is understanding. So first of all, there are 20,000 proteins approximately uh, encoded by the human genome and hundreds of thousands of different serines and threonine residues distributed throughout this. So the main focus of my project is to understand the rules of how a kinase selects which of these many serines across many of these proteins are uh, going to be phosphorylated. And essentially what determines, going back a bit, where these arrows go in diagrams like this. So the whole concept of phosphoregulation originated in a protein phosphorylation, that is uh, regulation originated in the 1950s in the laboratories of Fisher and Krebs. They were continuing work that had started in the Cori lab. And they were studying glycogen uh, metabolism, specifically the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. And they quite mysteriously found that there were two forms of this enzyme, depending on how it was purified. There was the B form that had low basal activity, and then there was the A form that was highly catalytically active. They were able to find that it was actually phosphorylation of the protein that was the difference between these two states. And later actually showed that it was a single serine, serine 15 towards the end terminus, where phosphorylation of this one residue was enough to catalytically activate the enzyme, bringing it to life. And, uh, and they furthermore identified the kinase specifically performing this phosphorylation and named it phosphorylase kinase. So fast forward 40 years with the sequencing of the human genome, we now know there are hundreds of protein kinases, of different protein kinases that regulate virtually every biological process. And additionally, a large subset of these are deregulated in many diseases, mostly cancers. Parallel to this uh, advances, 
in mass spec phosphoproteomics have dramatically enhanced our ability to find phosphorylation events happening in cells. In fact, uh, an experiment using this technique today can identify thousands of unique phosphorylation events in cells in single experiments. There are hundreds of thousands of unique sites of phosphorylation that have been reported. So these are annotated in the website Phosphocyte Plus, which is run by cell signaling technology. However, less than 4% of these sites have been associated with a specific kinase, so they would be considered orphaned. And in humans, there are 400 active, pro there are more than 400 actually active protein kinases, and most of these kinases have few known substrates. So a major challenge is understanding how all this is organized. And we would argue that knowledge of this organization will, first of all, provide us with a better understanding of how biological processes are regulated, and more importantly, how human diseases, how, can be, how signaling events are deregulated in human diseases. So our research applies biochemical approaches to address this extraordinary knowledge gap. The first question is what determines a kinase of cellular substrates? First and obvious condition is crossing paths. So the kinase and substrate need to at least encounter each other, of course. And this means they need to be expressed in the same tissues, the same cells actually. And within those cells, they need to localize near each other. Additionally, many kinase substrates are known to depend on docking mediated interactions where these other proteins bring them close together. And a growing number of kinase and substrates are known to be dependent on distant docking interactions. However, once the kinase, the catalytic site of the kinase and the substrate are close to each other, the ultimate determinant is the phosphorylation site itself. So while studied protein kinases are selective of their target sites. So right now we're talking about serine and threonine kinases. There's another large group of kinases that will only physically target and, and phosphorylate tyrosines. This is the third amino acid we're going to be discussing that gets phosphorylated. However, in addition to this, kinases are known to make physical contact with the amino acid sequence surrounding the site of phosphorylation. This is probably best represented in, with a spatial model. Here we're looking at a kinase in gray, essentially in the process of phosphorylating a substrate in yellow. Now, the specific serine site that gets phosphorylated, I colored in red. Also in orange is the ATP. As you can see, it's a little more internal in the kinase. And this is essentially the phosphate that's about to be transferred. So this is more accurately depicted with a space filling model. You can see as I rotate it that in addition to the serine residue, the kinase is making multiple contact with this surrounding amino acid sequence uh, residues in yellow, analogous to a lock and key. So how well the phosphorylation site fits in the catalytic site of the kinase is the final selectivity barrier. And this is what the focus of our research is. So well-studied kinases are known to recognize specific amino acids at many positions surrounding their site of phosphorylation. And this is referred to as their substrate motifs. And it's treated as sort of a code that guides the kinase in deciding which of the hundreds of thousands of serine threonine sites are going to fit best in its catalytic site and therefore get phosphorylated. Now, you can get this information on a kinase if you dive into the literature and try to identify as many po as possible substrate proteins that have been reported to be substrates for the kinase. And once you have all the substrate proteins, then you align their amino acid sequences that surround the site of phosphorylation. And then look for which amino acids are the most frequent at the surrounding positions of all these substrates that the kinase targets. And once you have this, you essentially have an amino acid sequence that the kinase looks for when it's deciding whether or not to phosphorylate a protein. And having this can be a very valuable way in identifying new targets and discovering new pathway regulations by the kinase. However, in order for this approach to be reliable, the kinase of interest needs to have hundreds of known substrates. And the majority of the overwhelming majority of human kinases do not have this. So in the 1990s, the Cantley lab developed a rapid method for obtaining the substrate motif for a given kinase. 
And this experimental approach utilizes synthetic peptide arrays that contain a serine or threonine at their central position, surrounded by random amino acid sequence. We then systematically substitute each of the 20 natural amino acids plus post-translational and modified amino acids into the surrounding positions. So we end up with 198, in this case, pep unique peptide mixtures that each contain a serine or threonine in a central position, a fixed distance away from each of the 20 amino acids that essentially singles them out and tells us how well does this serine phosphorylation site fit into the catalytic site of the kinase when it contains a specific amino acid here. Does that make it a better substrate or worse substrate for the kinase? So recombinant purified kinase and radio-labeled ATP gets added for the phosphorylation reaction. And then the peptides are isolated and imaged for their incorporation of phosphate, which is, is by following the radioactivity. We end up with an array of dots of varying intensity. So here we're looking at the experimental results for what is arguably the most well-studied kinase historically, protein kinase A or PKA. And uh, this kinase is downstream of a number of pharmacologically important pathways. And it's been studied for several decades, perhaps half a century at this point. However, if we knew nothing about PKA, we just landed on Earth and discovered it and wanted to know what its biological roles are, we would want to know what proteins it's phosphorylating and regulating. And to do and to, to help identify those proteins, we would want to know what sites it specifically targets for phosphorylation and which proteins carry those sites. So this approach would be especially valuable in that situation. So here we're looking at the results. So first of all, the serine threonine phosphoacceptor, this is the site that gets the phosphorylation, is, is, is designated position zero. Amino acids on the C-terminal side are given a plus sign. So we're looking at plus one. This is one residue to the right of it. Amino acids uh, positions on the on the left on the N terminal side are given a minus position. So for PKA, we go to minus five. So this is five residues N terminal before the serine threonine site. We see that when we substitute each of the 20 amino acids plus post-translational modified ones into the minus five position, we don't see a big difference in the signal at least not a heavily noticeable one. So we would give PKA simple substrate motif in X for minus five, indicating that it's not very selective there. Uh, same for minus four. However, when we get to minus three, we see strong signal for arginine and lysine, and also at minus two. So, and these are, so PKA prefers to phosphorylate then serine threonine sites that contain arginine or lysine at two and three residues and terminal to it. And these are positively charged amino acids. Continuing on, we cross over to the C-terminal side. And it first doesn't look like much is going on here, but then I need to draw your attention to this loss of signal up here at, at plus one for P for proline. So this tells us that protein kinase A, if it encounters a serine threonine site that has a proline at plus one, it is unlikely to phosphorylate it. So we're looking at discrimination here. So we would say not P for the plus one position. So this would be PKA simple substrate motif. It likes positively charged amino acids, uh, arginine and lysine at minus two and three, and it does not want to see proline at plus one. And also I should point out that uh, in addition to liking arginine and uh, lysine at these positions, we see a lower signal at most other amino acids are substituted into these positions. So this tells us that PKA not only likes arginine and lysine at these positions, but it actually prefers them. It selects for them. It discriminates against any other amino acid here, notably the negatively charged amino acids D and E. So PKA is one of the few kinases where we have the luxury of there being thousands of identified substrates from cellular research. And these have been annotated on the website Phosphosite that's run by Cell Signaling Technology. And here we're looking at the frequency of amino acids in these nearly 3,000 reported substrates. And we see that the most prominent features of this is arginine and lysine at minus two and minus three. And similarly, we see that proline is the least frequent amino acid at the plus one position 
as evidence that PKA is avoiding serine threonine sites that have proline directly after them. So this is an encouraging result to us because this is several decades of experimental work that's from probably hundreds of different laboratories. And, uh, and we are able to largely recapitulate this result with a 24 hour experiment. So this encouraged us to apply this technique to uh, as many other human protein serine threonine kinases as possible. And we finished with the profiling of 302 additional serine threonine kinases. And this work was recently published. One of the first takeaways is that, this, is that the substrate motifs of, of different kinases are diverse. It means that these different kinases are targeting different amino acid sequence features throughout the proteome. Here we see PKA. So this is a hierarchical clustering of each of the kinases dot arrays, which of course this webinar will, does not really have time to go into. But I can point out this is where protein kinase A clusters. So we're looking at its uh, in vitro, its peptide array motif, and we again see the arginine and lysines. So this is from the data that we saw one slide ago. And we also see the proline being disfavored at plus one. However, in contrast to that, we're looking at another kinase, CDK8, that actually prefers a proline at plus one. So it prefers to phosphorylate serine sites that have a proline right after them, which indicates that the substrates targeted by CDK8 and PKA are pro probably mutually exclusive, meaning that these kinases do not overlap much. And finally, for a little more contrast, I'm showing an example of a kinase GSK3 beta that specifically targets serines and threonines with negatively charged amino acids, phosphorylated ones actually on the C terminus. Anyway, the first thing we wanted to do with this data was apply it. And uh, this is where Tomer came in and helped wrote a, a computational code, a scoring system. And this is based on work that had continued throughout the Cantley, for the, throughout the last few decades in the Cantley lab. And, and this involves taking the amino acid sequence of a phosphorylation site of interest and entering it into the scoring system. And the scoring system then takes this sequence and sees how well it overlaps with the substrate motif, the, essentially the dot array of the kinase. Although I should say that this is, it's not done with the raw data. It's, this is uh, applied to the normalized data. But anyway, we take this and we apply this to all 303 kinase motifs, and then we see which kinase motifs overlap the most with this amino acid sequence. So here we're looking at the most extensively studied kinase substrate relationship, and that's phosphorylation of the tumor suppressor, P53, at serine 15 by the kinase ATM. You can see that when we apply this, we see that ATM, its motif, is second place out of 303 kinases. And additionally, the kinases surrounding it or joining it in these top rings, which include ATR, DNA, PK, and SMUG1, they have also been uh, reported to phosphorylate this site in P53. So we're looking at the top four kinases that we were able to identify. We had not known which kinase was actually performing this phosphorylation. Our approach would have been able to rapidly identify which ones and saved the experimenter a lot of work. And one thing to point out is that uh, this glutamine at plus one, our eyes can see that this is a major selective feature in ATM's substrate motif. And it's uh, the most prominent feature in its, uh, in its sequence logo. This is probably a major feature of the substrate that's driving this phosphorylation. So for fun, we also went back to the 1950 literature and uh, entered the, the, the amino acid sequence of the first phosphoregulation site identified on uh, glycogen phosphorylase. And we find uh, encouragingly that the phosphorylase kinase paralogs emerge as the top ranking predictions. So the scoring system has been incorporated into phosphocyte and it's mirrored at MIT by, the, by Mike Yaffe's lab. And this is a very convenient web tool that enables you to look at a protein and it maps out the protein by its, its amino acid sequence and to identify different post-translationally modification events. The blue uh, lollipops represent phosphorylation sites. And we're looking at uh, glycogen phosphorylase. And we can see, you can scroll down here to see the, the, the sites listed. 
we see that serine 15, this is the site that we just scored, that's the original uh, regulatory phosphorylation, is listed right here. And if you click the KL icon to the right of this cert in any serine threonine site, it will take you to our website, which in this case automatically scores that sequence and then provides, if you scroll down further, the list, the ranked list of the kinase motifs. However, you can enter any sequence you want into this, and then it will rank the kinases by their uh, predicted favorability. I should say that their predicted favorability is really treated by, as a probability for phosphorylation to occur. So one important point though, in cautionary note, is that not all substrates are equal. So here we're looking at, this is close to 90,000 serine threonine phosphorylation sites that have been confidently identified by mass spec. And we've scored all of them with the motifs of our 303 kinases. And then we sorted them by essentially their likability by the kinome. So what we're looking at on the right are substrates that are favored by a small number of kinase motifs. And as we move left, we see that uh, these are substrates that are favored by a larger number of kinase motifs. And so Identifying the upstream kinases, oh yeah, and throughout this, these yellow boxes represent well-studied kinase substrate relationships. And for two-thirds of the 90,000 substrates, our motif predictions can drastically reduce the number of kinases you have to experimentally test from 303 to you know, less than 10 in many cases. However, if you're studying, trying to identify the upstream kinase for a substrate out here, it's going to be more challenging because these sequences are perhaps designed to be phosphorylated by many different kinases. And that is to say that not every substrate has an equal number of upstream kinases. And indeed, many of these uh, specific phosphorylation sites are known to be regulated by multiple pathways. So they're considered convergent points. And so what that means is if one is trying to investigate and identify the upstream kinase for a substrate out here, it will benefit from having additional knowledge, additional layers such as the tissue specificity, which kinases are expressed in the same tissue as that substrate, and the stimuli that was applied to the system to see that phosphorylation. So uh, that is a complication in nature. So returning to uh, mass spec, so mass spec phosphoproteomics is our means of identifying 99.9% at least of uh, a phosphorylation events occurring across uh, cells. And so we wanted to see if we could apply our atlas of kinase substrate motifs to resolve information obtained from mass spec. So these experiments that we, so we, we, we were applying these to published experiments. So published experiments based on published data. It uh, involved taking a cell line by, and this was from other people, that undergone control or some type of treatment that is known to perturb its signaling pathways and its kinases. And the peptides are then identified, the phosphorylation sites are then identified and determined for which, which phosphorylation events go up and which phosphorylation events go down. So then what we did next was we scored the amino acid sequences around all these phosphorylation sites in these two categories, basically asking which kinases from our motif set scores favorably more often than expected in, among the phosphorylation sites that increased with this experimental treatment or that decreased with this experimental treatment uh, compared to the sites that don't change. And from this, we produce a second volcano plot that uh, organizes the kinase motifs and tells us, it, it provides us a way of inferring which kinases have been activated by this experimental perturbation or inhibited by this experimental perturbation. This is without any prior biological knowledge. It's based entirely on the scoring, the amino acid sequence surrounding the sites that were detected. Using this approach, we found that it works uh, extraordinarily well. Here we're looking at an example of uh, where colorectal cells have been treated with the uh, highly selective CDK8 inhibitor cortostatin A. In this volcano plot in blue, we're looking at the enkinase motifs that were enriched among the phosphorylations that decreased with this inhibitor. 
what we see without even knowing what cortostatin A was doing, we see CDK8's motif, the most enriched among the sites that decreased with the treatment of its inhibitor, indicating that this, this approach could have identified the direct target for this drug. And, and moreover, nested within this data set are dozens of, of direct, of like what are likely to be direct phosphorylation sites and newly discovered substrates for CDK8. A more complicated example is the treatment of uh, breast cancer cells with the antihyperglycemic agent metformin. And so what metformin does is it, through multiple mechanisms, it induces the cells into thinking that they are starving. And this causes them to import glucose and remove it from the bloodstream. The major effector kinases are the AMPKs or the AMPK activated kinases, or AMP activated kinases. And we see that after a 24 hour treatment with metformin, we see that among the phosphorylation sites that increased, the motifs that are the most enriched, so the most upregulated kinase motifs based on the amino acid sequences of those peptides are those of AMPK1 and 2, so both of the paralogs, indicating that we're actually also able to see kinases that increase with an experimental treatment, and furthermore, identify likely direct substrates for these kinases within this data set. And finally, the most complex example is a time course, where we're looking at adipocytes that have been treated with insulin. And uh, this kind of goes full circle to the diagram I showed earlier of the insulin signaling network. Anyway, at one minute following insulin treatment, we see enrichment of the kinase motifs in bold, many of which are red circles in the diagram that we saw towards the beginning. And these are kinases that are part, part of the PI3K signaling pathway. After 60 minutes, glucose has probably entered the cell, and we see a second group of anabolic kinases that are upregulated. We see the MAP kinase pathway, the ERKs and the RISCs being among the upregulated. And interestingly, simultaneously, we see enrichment of AMPK1 and 2 in the downregulate because these are starvation kinases. So it makes sense that since the cells are receiving glucose, they're no longer uh, in starvation mode. And importantly, throughout this, we are probably deconvoluting dozens of direct substrates for all these different groups of kinases. From a global extent, this is probably one of the most one, an important first step towards taking what are lists and uh, you know, large numbers of mass spec data and uh, what really are the first steps towards organizing them into signaling networks. And of course, understanding how these set networks are organized will give us a better understanding of biological processes, how they're regulated, and how they become deregulated in most human diseases. So as I wind down, I'm going to cover the second large group of protein kinases that uh, were identified in the Hunter lab uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, quite serendipitously. And this was first shown with the kinase SARC. So SARC is the first tyrosine kinase uh, to be discovered. And it's actually also the first discovered oncogene. And that link is not a coincidence. Tyrosine kinases, many of them are frequent drivers of human cancers. And so now we see that uh, instead of introducing this bulky negative charge to the, uh, the serine threonine side chains, these kinases will add it to tyrosine side chains. And I can't go into much more detail due to the time, due to time, but uh, can say that tyrosine kinases are very selective of the amino acid sequence surrounding the tyrosines they target, the tyrosine sites. And it's 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 in a different manner than serine threonine kinases, and they are likely playing by their own rules for this. Also, plants. I can't go into much detail with this, but we have an, another collaboration with. Uh, um, uh, Cyril Zipfel and Tom DeFalco labs who study uh, plant kinases. And I'm talking plants, I mean Arabidopsis. And the Arabidopsis kinome is roughly twice as large as the humans kinome. And 500 of these kinases are inventions of plants. So they have no orthologs in humans. And we've profiled a few of them. And they have completely different substrate motifs than human kinases. It was almost like profiling uh, a kinase from an extraterrestrial. So plants, plant signaling pathways are organized by very different rules than human kinase signaling pathways. 
And finally, I'm going to end with a specific example, the project that uh, was spearheaded by my colleague Tomer. And this was at the beginning of the COVID lockdown, where we were all at home and Tomer began looking at the proteins that were encoded in the genome of SARS-CoV-2. And he, when he reached the nucleocapsid protein, so this protein has the ability to, it interacts with the RNA genome and plays roles in packaging it. And this is on its, on, on its N terminal end. On C terminal end, it dimerizes with other nucleocapsid proteins. In between these is was an area that Tomer noticed was enriched in serine and threonine residues. I should say the virus does not encode any of its own kinases, so this was a curiosity. So Tomer uh, applied our system to score and predict the likely upstream kinases, and, and using this, he was able to predict the entire cascade of signaling events that enable most of these most of these sites to be phosphorylated. And through collaboration with uh, virologists, he was able to show that when you add targeted inhibitors or drugs that target these kinases at the top, the SRPKs, you could block the ability of the virus to infect cells. This was interesting because it presented a possibly a future direction in therapeutics as in, uh, for antiviral uh, medicines. And additionally, I guess from more of a knowledge-based standpoint, that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is using our own kinases to uh, mediate its infectivity. And so these serine threonine sites, like I said, this, this virus does not encode its own kinases, and the phosphorylation of these sites is required for its life cycle. And so it's taking advantage of three groups of kinases likely to uh, promote its infectivity. So that was sort of a, a neat insight. So here I'm going to end with a more extensive acknowledgement slide. And I thank you for attending, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. As we conclude, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thanks to Dr. Johnson for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us today. We'll now open the floor to questions. Please don't hesitate to share your thoughts in a discussion with Dr. Johnson. So I'll begin with the first question. How does the in vitro substrate motif of ABL kinase compare to its in vivo targets? Are there any significant differences in recognition or binding? They're very similar. ABL is actually a very nice example where we see uh, lots of overlap between the sequences on its target sites, particularly the site on CRKL, Crackle, which is its most well-studied target, uh, aligns very nicely with its substrate motif. So we believe that the tyrosine kinases really are distinct, are hitting unique targets and are distinguishing them by the sequence around the sites. What roles do chitin, at PEP1, and peptidoglycan recognition play in plant immune responses? I'm not a plant biologist, but I think that this is an immune signaling because this chitin is, is, I think, part of insect cell uh, and, and maybe it's in funguses. I don't really, but I think it serves as an alarm for the plant that uh, that there is danger near it, and it needs to activate some type of uh, compensatory, uh, you know, some type of response to the signaling. Since most kinases are part of the same family tree, I wonder if this gives a clue as to the first kinase regulatory mm. network to emerge in life. Mm. In what domain did kinase signaling evolve? <laughs> yes, yes. So. Uh, kinases actually do exist in bacteria, but they are of a completely different protein fold. And uh, but uh, at the earliest form of eukaryotes, I honestly am not sure what the original, the the, the prototypical first kinase was. But that's a that's an interesting question. How does the phosphorylation event by CSK lead to a conformational change in SRC, and what is the mechanism behind this change? Yeah, so the phosphorylation of the C terminus of SARC, it does two things. It, I think it's it's shown to Alice. Well, first of all, it interacts with SARC's own SH2 domain. And so by doing that, it's preventing SARC's SH2 domain from engaging receptor tyrosine kinases or 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 you know signaling. But I think it also actually has an allosteric effect where it inhibits its catalytic activity. So I think that the mechanism of inhibition there is twofold. 
What are the specific challenges researchers face in identifying and studying the specific targets of individual kinases? Uh, I think that one of the bigger challenges is if you're studying a target that is known to be regulated by many upstream kinases, then just using the motif is not going to narrow it. It will narrow it down, uh, you know, probably considerably, but still it will leave behind a lot of potential upstream kinases that just biochemically are able to phosphorylate that site. And so at that point, it, it then becomes on the experimenter to understand what uh, their biological system, what kinases are present in the cells they're studying, what, uh, what stimuli was what was used to identify that phosphorylation so so there are certain things where more information is needed so i think that's one of the bigger challenges is this, but that also means that if it's a convergent phosphorylation site it means that it probably it, it is likely to be an important one since multiple pathways depend on it so you might see uh might be more likely to see functional effects by mutating that site can we get the sequence specificity of a kinase from the phosphocyte website, querying the kinase rather than the sequence? Yes, yes. It's it's a little bit less straightforward. Actually, no, it's not. Um, if you scroll down on that web page, you'll see a uh, a large file, like 600 uh, megabytes, that actually has the raw data and the heat maps and the logos for each of the 303 serine three ending kinases that we published in the paper. Uh, when we published this uh, this file, we had to compress it in order to for it to, the, to 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 agree with the standards of the the journal. And in compressing it, we just I think we lost some of the quality of the data. So I uh, put the larger file on there. So if you scroll to the bottom of the page, it should say maybe supplementary figure one or something. It will take you to a page that lists all the, all, all the kinases. They, I think they're arranged by gene name and they're connected to hyperlinks where if you click them, it will take you to the page and you can look at uh, what it likes. Do substrate proteins need to be unfolded? Why do we only have the peptide kinase complexes in PDB? Yes, uh, well, because uh, so there are not very many uh, published crystal structures of kinases in a complex with their substrate. And the reason for that is that the event of phosphorylation is transient. And so uh, it, I think it ends up being lucky if you can fix the, the peptide to the kinase. It's, uh, it's a distinction between binding and catalysis because the peptide substrate wants to bind to the kinase, but it also doesn't want to stay bound. So once it's phosphorylated, it needs to leave. Otherwise, the kinase is going to just have one substrate, and most kinases have hundreds. Did I answer that question, though? I'm not sure. Uh, and regarding the unfolding aspects, um, yes. Uh, most of the regions that get phosphorylated on proteins, uh, they tend to not resolve well in crystal structures because they are flexible and unfolded and likely to be more uh, regulatory. Are there any specific conditions under which CSK preferentially phosphorylates the SRC C terminal tail, such as particular cellular stresses or signaling events? Oh, the, 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 so I think that that is a, it, I, I could be wrong, but I think that is a basal level of regulation because most of the time SARC and tyrosine kinases, they're different from serine threonine kinases where they just tend to be turned off unless there's some sort of stimulus. So in the case of the insulin pathway, that receptor is not going to be phosphorylating anything until insulin's added and then it starts phosphorylating tyrosine. So I think that that is just a, uh, that's a, uh, a general difference between tyrosine kinases and serine threonines is serine threonine phosphorylation happens around the clock and tyrosine phosphorylation generally needs to be stimulated. So, uh, but that, that's a, not really answering your question. CSK is one of the few tyrosine kinases that's not, that, that's, it's not regulated the same way as others. It appears to be constitutively active and, and I'm assuming that it's basal activity. It's usually just keeping the SARC family kinases in check. And then when there's a, 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 a stimulation event or a, a variety of, a, of other events, even dephosphorylation by, which gets more complicated, then uh, SARC and other kinases can outmuscle CSK and uh, set off a signaling cascade.
what were specific pathways that were affected by cort cortistatin A, CA, in the quantitative proteome analysis? Uh, well, so this is uh, Dylan Tatch's paper. He did beautiful work in creating that fossil proteomic data set. And uh, he identified a number of substrates that uh, that we confirmed that uh, look to be transcriptional. And so, so yeah, it uh, that definitely is a case because I didn't talk about uh, the, the the functional outcomes of phosphorylations. I purposefully turned a blind eye to during this talk because because that's just really complicated. Um, how do mediator kinases regulate chromatin and RNA polymerase two activity? Okay, so that's yeah, so that's in the field. That's a that's a, a different type of signaling code. So RNA polymerase two, which makes all the mRNA, it's really the the protein complex that's responsible for transcription. It has a very long C terminal tail. I can't remember. I think it's like hundreds of residues long, and it's a repeat of uh, of a seven amino acid sequence. Anyway, this amino acid sequence gets targeted by first of all the the transcription initiator complex has its own CDK, CDK7. The mediator complex has CDK8 and possibly 19. And anyway, so phosphorylation happens actually on this very long C-terminal tail of RNA polymerase II. And uh, the outcomes from that are, the are, 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 I think, release and initiation of transcription, elongation of transcription, recruitment of splicing factors. So this is, so transcription is a highly coordinated process uh, involving uh, phosphorylation of this, of this tail, which uh, is conserved back to yeast and uh, yeah, is, 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 is a highly orchestrated process. Is there a way to determine when a scaffolding protein is necessary for the phosphorylation to take place? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in the case of SARC and CSK, you couldn't really tell by the blue shading because I didn't have time. But, uh, but even though CSK was the top predicted kinase for that site on SARC, it still got a lousy score. And, uh, and, and that is that can be that's best explained by the fact that it depends on docking and physical association in order to phosphorylate that site. So I think that this 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 prediction, the motif based prediction, is better suited to identify kinase substrates that interact very transiently. And uh, other approaches like interactomics, you know, a, a variety of different ways to to approach that. Uh, I, I, I think well, where you look at protein-protein interactions, I think that those approaches will are, are will synergize with this approach. Where if you're looking at a, a an event that depends on physical interaction, you might end up identify the kinase substrate that way, and then we will take the sequence and look to see which sites are likely to be phosphorylated. So I can see that being a, a way of meeting uh, those types of phosphorylations halfway. In the Hunter lab, there is now interest in histidine phosphorylation. Is it possible to map the substrate preferences of histidine kinases as well? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and um, it's it's a different type of problem now because we, ha in this case, we we know what the histidine kinases are, and the question is where what are they phosphorylating? So in this case, we're instead of finding the substrate and working backwards to the kinase. We, we we know the kinases and we're working forward to the substrates and a way of doing that would be to um uh there are a variety of ways but uh the, the most expensive way would be create a peptide library that specifically has histidine at the center and then screening it and then there's the possibility for old school approaches where we uh we take a randomized peptide and look and and, and you know, I, I guess uh, perform phosphorylation reactions, separate phosphorylated from unphosphorylated, and then perform Edmund degradation to see the frequency of amino acids. When you say plants have many unique kinases, do you mean unique based on sequence identity slash divergence or on predicted functionality? Oh, uh, so I don't know much about functionality for plant kinases. I've been largely in the realm of human or mammalian signaling pathways, but I'm talking about sequence specificity. They profiling these kinases is uh, is not too different, I think, than profiling 
identified kinases in an extraterrestrial species. It, 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 it's just completely different, different positions they care about, and they care about different amino acids at those positions. So the, the plants have uh, solved signaling pathways using different rules. Okay. Um, then as we wrap up today's session, once again, I'd like to express our gratitude to Dr. Johnson for joining us today. Thank you also to everyone who participated in the discussion. In closing, we hope that you found this webinar enlightening and that it has been sparking new ideas and deepened your understanding of protein phosphorylation and cellular signaling pathways. We look forward to hosting you again in the future. Um, thank you once again for your participation and have a great day.